Welcome to the National Archives and Records Administration's 2024 Genealogy Series. My name is Erin Townsend, and I am the coordinator for this year's program. We are so happy you've joined us. Every year, the National Archives hosts the Genealogy Series, a free educational genealogy event broadcast on YouTube. Our presenters are records experts from National Archives locations across the United States. The sessions offer family history research tools on federal records and are open to everyone from beginners to experienced family historians. All are welcome. We invite you to join the conversation. During each session's premiere, you can participate with the presenters and other family historians via live chat. Ask questions and get the presenters answers anytime throughout the video and for an additional 10 minutes after the presentation ends. Here's how to engage in the live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch chat because the speaker will answer your questions there. Type your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Please keep your questions on today's topic. We are offering five genealogy sessions on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time starting May 21st and ending June 25th. We will not have a session on June 11th. If you miss a premiere broadcast, please know that videos and handouts remain available online after the event, where you can view them at your convenience. Today's presentation is entitled Alien Files, Researching Immigrant Ancestors at the National Archives. Our presenter is Elizabeth Burns, Elizabeth is an archivist at the National Archives at Kansas City and serves as the lead archivist for A-Files Reference. She is also a subject matter expert for immigrant-related records. Elizabeth received a bachelor's degree in history at Truman State University and a master's degree in history and museum studies at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter today, Elizabeth Burns. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Burns, and today we'll be discussing alien files, more commonly called A-files. Whether you're just starting out researching your immigrant ancestry or are deeper into your research process, A-files may be a useful resource in understanding your family's immigrant experience and gaining additional biographical details about an individual immigrant ancestor. During today's session, we will go over background information about what A-files are and who should have them. We'll look at some potential file content you may come across, and we'll walk through the reference process to help ensure your success as you begin your research. So let's start out by looking at the history of A-Files. The 1940 Alien Registration Act required all immigrants aged 14 and above to visit their local post office between August and December of 1940 to register their alien or non-citizen status with the federal government. The process included completing an alien registration form, an AR2, and being fingerprinted. The Postal Service mailed over 5 million completed AR2 forms to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS. As the forms were received, INS staff assigned individual alien registration numbers, A numbers, on each form, and an attached alien registration receipt card was removed and mailed back to the immigrant to keep as proof of registration. This concept of a registration card for immigrants began with this 1940 alien registration process and continues today in the permanent resident card, often called a green card. Since September 27, 1906, INS has been utilizing a filing system that created a separate record series for each action that an immigrant may take during their interactions with the agency. Rather than having a consolidated single record for each immigrant, one person could have several INS files that existed, including visa files, registry files, petition files, certificate files, Chinese exclusion files, district office files, and so on. The introduction of the alien registration numbers as a unique identifier for each immigrant provided an opportunity to change the filing system. Beginning April 1st, 1944, alien files, with the shortened named A files, were created utilizing the registration numbers as file numbers. A files were initially created to document the immigration and inspection process, but ultimately reflect the interaction of an immigrant with the federal government throughout their time in the United States. 
leading up to any final action such as death, departure, deportation, permanent resident status, or citizenship. The new A files became a point of consolidation for the earlier file types that may have been created for an immigrant, with the exception of certificate files, more commonly called C files, that continued to be created to document naturalization proceedings through March 31st of 1956. Beginning April 1st, 1956, A files became the singular record for all new immigrants and newly naturalized U.S. citizens. And the file series is still created and utilized today by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, which is the successor organization for INS. I will note at this point that although the intention of INS beginning in 1944 was to consolidate all records that existed in the, into the A-file for an individual. In practice, that did not always occur. So researchers should consider whether an earlier INS record may have been created for the immigrant of interest that they, that they may have that would exist outside of the A-file. Since the early 20th century, the United States collected increasing amounts of information from immigrants, and A-files are a good representation of this increased bureaucracy, as the files can include visas, applications, affidavits, correspondence, photographs, and more. For some researchers, the A-files can be a one-stop shop because they can include records dating from the birth of the subject to, in some cases, nearly current day. The files do vary person to person, so there is no standard an A file will always have X statement that can be made. The files can even contain documents that are from local or international sources, such as vital records, which normally do not appear within National Archives holdings. This also means that the files can vary greatly in size from one page to hundreds or thousands of pages in some cases. As you begin to consider research, it's important to understand who should, or in some cases who definitely won't, have an A file. This table will get you started at a high level. The big keys to keep in mind are, number one, was your immigrant alive in August of 1940? If they died prior to August 1st of 1940, they would not have participated in the alien registration and would not have been assigned an A number. In those cases, you'll wanna consider looking for documentation of their arrival to the United States. Number two, was your immigrant ever naturalized? If so, when did that occur? If they naturalized between September 27, 1906 and March 31, 1956, they likely have a certificate file, C file, and not an A file. A basic C file contains the certificate of naturalization, petition for naturalization, and declaration of intention. C files are available through the USCIS genealogy program. At the National Archives, A files can largely be found at the National Archives at Kansas City, where A files for the entire United States and its territories are being centralized. Because of strong interest and advocacy for the A files by local research communities and their congressional representatives, the National Archives at San Francisco maintains some of the A files for the INS district offices located in San Francisco, Honolulu, Reno, and Guam. Researchers seeking individuals who may have lived in these areas should check both Kansas City and San Francisco for A files. It's also important to note that A files maintained in Kansas City are stored off site and require advance notice for retrieval. As of November 2023, Kansas City has nearly 1.3 million A files for individuals for 1920 and earlier, and San Francisco has 300,000 A files for individuals for 1920 and earlier. The current San Francisco holdings are largely from the INS district offices in Honolulu and San Francisco. A files are eligible for transfer to the National Archives when the year of birth for the subject is 100 or more years old. It's important to note that although the National Archives currently maintains A files for individuals born 1920 and prior, we do not yet maintain all of the files for individuals born 1920 and prior. The majority of A files are still maintained by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. Before we dive further into our conversation on A files, I want to take a moment and address some common misconceptions that we hear from researchers regarding A files and immigrant research. One of the most common is that A files are the same as enemy alien registration affidavits. 
enemy aliens are individuals living in the United States who are citizens of countries at war with the United States. Enemy alien registration affidavits were created from 1918 to 1919 as part of the enemy alien requirements of German immigrants residing in the U.S. during World War I. Only a small percentage of the World War I enemy alien registration affidavits exist today. The important thing to understand with this misconception is that A files were created beginning in April 1944 and are not specific to enemy aliens. At the highest level, all enemy aliens are aliens, but not all aliens are enemy aliens. It is accurate to say that enemy aliens can be documented in A-files, though. For example, 1942 applications for certificates of identity that were completed by German, Italian, and Japanese immigrants that were considered enemy aliens during World War II were often consolidated into A-files. Another common misconception is that all immigrants naturalized. Naturalization is and has always been a voluntary act. It is not required for an immigrant entering the U.S. to become a naturalized citizen. The statistic on the slide is an interesting one that I've come across regarding percentages of immigrants who pursued U.S. citizenship. Of the foreign-born persons listed on the 1890 through 1930 censuses, 25% had not become naturalized or filed a declaration of intention, what's sometimes called first papers, indicating their intent to become a U.S. citizen. 25% is not an insignificant number when you look at the overall population of the United States. Just as there can be confusion around naturalization, it's also a common misconception that A-files only represent non-citizens. It is true that from April 1st, 1944 to March 31st, 1956, A-files rarely include citizenship records. However, beginning April 1st, 1956, a-files serve as a consolidated point of documentation for all of an immigrant's records, and it's still an active file series utilized today. I'll also point out that there can even be A-files for individuals who are American-born. There could have been a question about an individual citizenship status, or for those familiar with laws impacting women's citizenship, you can see A-files documenting repatriations that were completed to return U.S. citizenship to American-born women who lost their U.S. citizenship due to marriage to a husband who was not a United States citizen. A final misconception I'll address is confusion over the assistance and service that National Archives staff can offer to researchers who are pursuing dual citizenship. There has been a huge uptick in requests from dual citizenship seekers over the past several years. And in an effort to aid that research community, we created an FAQ that looks at some of the most common questions and points of confusion that we address. If you're a dual citizenship seeker, I highly recommend reviewing the FAQ page as you prepare to submit requests to National Archives staff. Having talked through the history and context for A-Files, let's look more in depth at some of the content you may come across as you utilize A-Files in your research process. As I noted earlier, no two A-Files are alike. The content depends entirely on a given individual's interactions with the federal government and the documents created out of that interaction. One common document in the early low-numbered A-files is the 1940 Alien Registration Form, the AR2. This form gathers great basic biographical information about the subject of the record. What is their full name? What name did they enter the country under? What other names have they utilized? When and where were they born? A physical description. When, where, and how did they enter the U.S.? What is their occupation? both past and present? Are they a member of any organizations or clubs? Do they have prior military service? Have they attempted to obtain U.S. citizenship? Do they have any other family members like parents, spouse, and children residing in the U.S.? Do they have any prior arrests, indictments, or convictions? Have they been affiliated with any organizations devoted to influencing political activities or public policy of a foreign government? For smaller A-files, where the AR2 is one of or the only document in the A-file, I encourage researchers to consider how they can use the information on the form as a jumping off point for additional research. If they provide a date, port, and vessel of arrival, can you locate the, the correlating passenger manifest document? If they list an employer and or clubs that they participated in, do those organizations have records that still exist today, whether at a local historical society or archive? 
if they noted that they had filed a declaration of intention to start the naturalization process? Can you track down that court document? If they indicate prior military service, can you look into military records maintained by the organization they reference? If they cite a prior criminal conviction, can you look into court and penal records from the area where the event occurred? And so on. It's easy to take the information at face value, but sometimes there may be an opportunity to locate additional supporting documents outside of the A file. One of my favorite documents that can appear in A files is the immigration visa and alien registration application. This form has taken on different formats and content over the years, but what makes this document exciting is that it is often where supplemental records, such as birth certificates, baptismal records, marriage certificates, and so on will appear. This form also consistently includes a photograph of the subject with their signature included. And for many researchers, this may be the first time they're seeing their ancestor. The form itself normally builds on the kinds of information gathered by the original alien registration form. But what's nice about this particular application is that you often get parent names, including mother's maiden name. You may also get details about the spouse and children, prior foreign residences, and employment. I worked with a researcher in France who had tracked down an A file for her great uncle Moisha. His immigration visa and alien registration form highlighted his life both before and during World War II. Born May 10, 1898 in Radun, Poland, Moisha had spent his life until World War II in his hometown. He then moved to the ghetto in Radun for a year, fled to hide in the woods of Poland for two years, and eventually spent time in Berlin, Germany, and in a displaced persons camp in Eschwege, Germany until National Refugee Service Incorporated paid his passage to the United States. Prior to seeing the A-file, the family had no idea how Moisha had survived or what had become of him during the war. At the opposite end of the spectrum, there are documents like the annual address report cards that don't, upon first glance, appear to researchers as being as useful as documents like the forms we've discussed so far. Address reporting was a requirement every year for registered non-citizens in the U.S. after the initial 1940 alien registration process was completed. Each year, as the new address report came into the A file, the old report would be removed. So, in many cases, you may only find one address report in the file. But there are occasions where lots of address report cards were kept in an A file. The form contains very basic information, name, alien registration number, date of birth, country of birth, address, date card was completed, and a signature. Genealogists normally start out tracking ancestors in the federal census, so they're getting a look at individuals every 10 years. What I tend to point out to researchers is that because the address reporting was an annual action, you're getting a glimpse of an individual in non-census years. In some cases, this may be key for understanding what happened to a family. I had a researcher who knew that their ancestors resided in New Jersey, and they firmly believed the family had only ever resided in that state, but they had a gap in their research that they couldn't fill. It was as if the family disappeared for a period of time. With the help of Adder's report cards, we discovered that the family had briefly moved to California, literally across the country, before later returning to New Jersey for the remainder of their lives. This knowledge opened up new search outlets that the researcher hadn't previously considered. As I noted, the A-files can sometimes contain surprising documents that would not normally appear in National Archives holdings, such as vital records. Vital record documents can include birth certificates, baptismal certificates, marriage certificates, divorce decrees, death certificates, etc. Normally, these records are found in the county, state, or country where the documents were created. But they can appear in our federal holdings at the National Archives in cases where they were submitted as supplemental records for applications submitted to INS. It's fun to come across vital records in, issued by foreign governments because they normally appear in, in the language used by that nation. A few miscellaneous records to mention from A files include the notice, notice, this file is not consolidated note at far left on this slide. That document was inserted into A files during the 1950s by the administrative side of INS to indicate to the investigative side of the agency that they should not stop with the A file when they were researching a subject. You'll remember that INS filing systems were in transition at this time, and due to prior filing schemes existing, there may be multiple file types that were present for one person. Although there may be no additional records that exist, 
I tell researchers to use that same thought process that INS investigators would have applied in their work. Consider what kinds of records could exist and how you would determine where to look next. Always consider jumping off points and the bigger picture of INS record keeping when you're researching an immigrant ancestor. The record at the center of the slide is an application and permit for reentry to the U.S. These documents were issued as an immigrant traveled in and out of the U.S. and can provide you with additional insights into personal and business travel if the immigrant completed. If they were traveling for pleasure, you may discover additional details about the family members residing abroad. If they were traveling for business, you may learn more about their work activities and colleagues. On the right of this slide, you see a report of departure for alien. Not all immigrants remained in the U.S. permanently. If a non-citizen decided to leave the U.S. of their own accord or due to a deportation, this report was issued to confirm when, where, and via which vessel the individual departed from the U.S. In some cases, this may represent closure of the A file if the subject of the file never re-entered the U.S. in subsequent decades. Additionally, within an A file, you may find naturalization records, including the Declaration of Intention, Petition for Naturalization, and Certificate of Naturalization, or Certificate of Citizenship, along with additional documents created during the naturalization proceeding. We often have researchers contact us inquiring about obtaining a copy of the Certificate of Naturalization for an immigrant. Normally, the certificate does not appear in National Archives holdings, as historically, the National Archives maintained only the federal court naturalization records, the Declaration and Petition, in our Record Group 21, Records of the U.S. District Court's records. But with the addition of A-files in Record Group 566, Records of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, there is potential, especially in cases of post-April 1, 1956 naturalizations, that the certificate may be available in our holdings. Another point to mention is that in cases of derivative citizenship, the naturalization records of the individual who afforded the subject access to U.S. citizenship may appear in the A file. Mentioning derivative citizenship, I'll also take a moment to answer a question many researchers pose about certificates of naturalization versus certificates of citizenship. Naturalization acts historically referred to certificates of naturalization as certificates of citizenship. In practice, the term certificate of naturalization, which is presently tied to form N550 and its variants, was used for those who completed the traditional naturalization process. And the term certificate of citizenship, presently tied to form N560 and its variants, was used for derivative citizenship. Sometimes the N550 certificate of naturalization had a heading that read certificate of citizenship. For stretches in the 1930s, for example, the Certificate of Naturalization read Certificate of Citizenship. And there were cases where an individual lost an earlier N-550 that said Certificate of Naturalization and received a replacement that said Certificate of Citizenship. The certificate heading only reflects when the document was printed and what design was being used at the time. The heading does not indicate anything about the naturalization itself. The form number on the certificate and the text on the certificate will indicate if it's a derivative citizenship. As we wrap up discussing general A-file content, there are some additional immigrant-related record types I wanted to point out that can appear in the files. Passenger manifest and border crossing records or associated information can be included, especially in cases where an immigrant was working to prove legal entry into the U.S. Other INS file types may have been consolidated into an A-file, including visa files, registry files, petition files, Chinese exclusion files, etc. Both foreign and U.S. passports can sometimes appear. Full deportation cases can be included with warrants, interview transcripts, investigation reports, and so on documented in the aid file. Immigrants from Germany, Italy, and Japan have their World War II enemy alien experiences documented beginning with the 1942 applications for certificates of identification that were, were required of them to complete, moving into documentation of internment in the U.S. for the duration of the war, and in some cases, expatriation from the U.S. in the post-war years, in many, cases, in many cases with subsequent return to the U.S. Ultimately, no two A files are the same. The file content is entirely dependent upon that individual's interactions with the federal government. 
Hopefully, the overview I provided gives you an idea of what you might see as you dive into A-file research. Let's move now into the record request process. We'll walk through the steps you need to take to ensure success of your inquiry. But researchers are always welcome to contact National Archives staff to obtain additional guidance and ask questions. Don't ever be afraid to contact us with questions. All of the A-files currently maintained by the National Archives are indexed in our online catalog, which you can visit online at catalog.archives.gov. The files are not digitized, so you won't see images of the file content, but the catalog is your best first step in researching these records. A quick aside, National Archives partners like Ancestry and FamilySearch have posted partial indexes of our A-file holdings, but you need to keep in mind that the most comprehensive and up-to-date index option will always be the National Archives catalog. I know that the catalog can be daunting for some researchers, so I want to take some time today to break down what you're seeing and where you should be looking. First, let's take a look at the basic anatomy of a catalog entry. Some of the key pieces of information that you'll find in the catalog results list are the title for each entry, which includes the name of the file subject, the National Archives identifier, or NAID, that is a unique identifier assigned to every description in the catalog. It's specific to that item, file, or series, and can immediately allow staff to, quote unquote, see what you're seeing. And the local identifier, which is comprised of the alias registration number, the A number, the transfer number where the file can be found, and the box number. As you review the result list, you'll also notice that below the title line, there's a truncated version of the scope and content note, which provides a quick glimpse of biographical data about the file subject. We'll talk more about that momentarily. Before we move on, I want to point out that within each catalog entry, you will find the location of record noted. And this is an important piece of information to review, as it will give which National Archives office you need to submit your request to. Remember, a files can be found in both Kansas City and San Francisco. Diving deeper into the scope and content note, you'll find that the amounts and kinds of information listed in the scope and content note may vary widely. This data was culled from the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Central Index System data that we received with each transfer of record. The information recorded depends on what details the USCIS input for a given individual. In all cases, the catalog entry will include the alien registration number in the local identifier field that we talked about, the subject's first and last name in the title field, and the date of birth in the scope and content note. That note may also include alias names. For women, this is normally their maiden name, their country of birth, their date and place of entry to the US, parent names, and naturalization details. The important thing for researchers to keep in mind is that even the basic information in the scope and content note may help you determine if an AFAL could potentially be a match for someone you're seeking. You may get multiple catalog result hits matching the name that you're seeking, so noting the date of birth may be key. For example, if you know that you're seeking Antonio Grande, born in 1875, seeing results for an Antonio Grande born in 1913, would likely indicate that this is not the person you are seeking. There are different approaches that you can take when you search the catalog. We'll look at two today. The first is a basic search right from the main page at catalog.archives.gov. You can visit the web page and in the main search bar, start typing search terms. For A files, this can be the first name and or surname or the alien registration number. For A numbers, you need to be aware that the number must be in A1234567 format. It must start with an A, and it can't include any spaces or other punctuation for catalog search purposes. A numbers can appear in a variety of other documents, like passenger manifests, petitions for naturalization, within family records even, and they may show up in different formats. But for the catalog search, you need to type the number in A1234567 form. When you do a basic search from the catalog main page, you're casting a wide net across the entire catalog. So you need to keep in mind that the results will likely include entries that are not A files. You will be looking for results with the title Alien Case File 4, subject's name, or A File 4, subject's name. 
you can see on the right side of the screen a results list for a search on the name Antonio Grande. I've circled two titles that are A files, but you see there were other result hits that populated. If you see additional name matches that don't include those A file terms in the title, it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be relevant to your research, but it does mean that they are not A files. In those cases, it's very important to look at the location of record listed and email that office directly to inquire more about what the record is. Remember, A files are only maintained in Kansas City and San Francisco at the National Archives. Because searching everything under the entire umbrella of the catalog may feel overwhelming, one way to put on those blinders and successfully narrow the scope of your search is to complete a search within the A-file series. You'll go to the A-file series description for Kansas City or San Francisco and click on the blue search within this series button to limit your search to only A-files at that location. Remember, you may need to search both Kansas City and San Francisco if the immigrant you're researching resided in San Francisco, Reno, Guam, or the Honolulu area. Once you've selected the search within button, a new search page will open and you'll be able to then search in the same way I described previously by first name and or surname or a number. When I complete the search within function, I normally try the following term combinations and browse the results to ensure that I'm seeing all the possible relevant results. I start first with just surname to cast a wide search and see how many results I'm dealing with. I'll search individually on all known surname variants. This is important because the system is not going to make assumptions about spelling variations in the way that you may need. I'll then try a first name and surname combination, again, using all known variants. If I'm still seeing too many results to browse quickly, I'll try surname and year of birth, for example, entering Grande and 1875 in the search box. Occasionally, if the first name is, new, is unique and the surname is more common, I may also try first name and year of birth. Another search approach that researchers may not be aware of for A files in the catalog is just searching on date of birth. I will note that there may be inconsistencies in how the date was input, so I would always try both with and without leaving zeros for the month and day. If you locate a potential match or matches within the catalog, you can then move forward and submit your request. You'll be emailing either the Kansas City A file specific email account or the San Francisco main reference account to submit your inquiry. A successful request will include the file subject's complete name, including known variants, as well as the local identifier and national archives identifier from the catalog. It may sound like a lot to gather, but remember that all of those details are available in the catalog results entry for each file. You don't have to do in-depth searching for those details. We provide them right up front in the catalog. It's also helpful to include some additional biographical details in your request to aid in confirming a match to the individual that you're seeking. This information can include the individual's approximate date and place of birth, including known date variants, the individual's approximate date of entry to the U.S., the city and state where they resided in the U.S., and names of immediate family members like parents, spouse, and children. In my response to researchers, I always pull some basic biographical details from the file to ensure that the researcher can feel more confident about the match to their research subject. But it can be helpful for me to have some information like what I just listed so that if it turns out that the file is not a match, I can make helpful referrals for next steps in the research process. Researchers are welcome to visit on site in Kansas City and San Francisco to view A files in person in our research rooms. Please note, A files cannot be shipped between National Archives locations, and appointments are required for research visits. Appointments are important because A files in Kansas City are stored off site and require advance notice for retrieval, and A files in both Kansas City and San Francisco require advanced screening by staff prior to public use. If you're searching the catalog, feel confident that the person you're researching should have an A file, but you cannot find any possible match for the individual you're seeking, it is because the National Archives does not currently maintain an A file record for that person. It does not necessarily mean that no A file exists at all. You can continue checking the National Archives catalog over time, 
as new AVALs will be coming into our holdings annually. You can also continue your search by contacting the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, through their genealogy program or through the USCIS Freedom of Information Act FOIA program. USCIS continues to maintain all active and inactive A files that have not yet been transferred into the holdings of the National Archives. At USCIS, the A files are divided between genealogy and FOIA based on the A number. Files with an A number below 8 million, aka early A files, often created pre-1951, are maintained by genealogy. And A numbers above 8 million, often created 1951 and after, are maintained by FOIA. At the National Archives, there is an A-file specific fee schedule that is applied when copies of an A-file are ordered. A-files with a date of birth prior to 1890 are a standard $27 fee, and A-files with a date of birth 1890 and after are a standard $40 fee. For those requiring certified copies, there is an additional $15 fee for certification per certification packet up to 150 pages. Certified copies must be provided in paper format and standard mail order services fees include one copy format, scan or paper. We've covered a lot of ground in today's program, so if you need a quick refresher or would like additional details on related topics, I want to point out two web resources. One is the A-file specific web page on the National Archives site. The other is the Immigrant Records landing page on the National Archives site. If you're completing immigrant related research, these resources may help push your research into areas you hadn't previously considered. It's worth perusing both when you have time. I hope today's session has provided you with a stronger understanding of what A-files are, how they may be useful in your research, and what you need to do to successfully request an A-file. If you have questions about A-files research or next steps in your immigrant research process, please email our staff so we can assist you. I hope to see many of you submitting A-file requests in the coming weeks and months. Thank you for your time today. Thank you again for watching. This ends the lecture portion of the broadcast, but we will continue to take your questions about today's topic in the chat. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email at inquire at nara.gov. Note that the videos and handouts will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. We plan future programs based on your feedback. Would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation form? At this time, I'd like to thank the Genealogy Series team who contributed to the success of this program. We are grateful for your work. If you enjoyed this video, check out our Know Your Records program. We have over 100 educational videos on how to conduct research at the National Archives. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in the chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation.